Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Coming Out Stories from India series. Coming out, what is it? Coming out is a term used primarily in the LGBT community when a queer person shares about their sexual orientation, usually with friends and family. Nicola and I decided to launch these Coming Out Stories from India to ensure we all work together in changing the narrative. The last few years, since my own coming out, I've been looking for role models, stories that can help me in my own journey. No, there were hardly any, if at all, not in depth enough. So what was common to most is the challenges that most have faced. But we also discovered that not all stories are that of pain, suffering, and trauma either. This is when the coming out stories from India started taking shape in our minds to bring to our audience real people with their real stories, keeping in mind the complexities of India though. Hopefully these coming out stories can help pave the way for those who are in any phase of their coming out journey. I'm Raga Olga De Silva, or Totally Out Now, as you know me. Now today's guest has an interesting journey. He came out to his parents much later in life. He has been with his long-term partner living freely and it made me think, was it always like this for him? He also works and represents corporate India for us and is the people and culture director for a leading international gaming organization. So what does he do with this organization? How does he help bring about change in the industry for our community, the LGBT community? Please join me in welcoming Rajiv Sharma. Hi, Raga. Hey, Rajiv, how are you? I'm good, how are you? All well, thank you. And where are you right now? I'm in Noida, Noida, India. Okay. And is that where you grew up? Yes, I grew up in India. I grew up in Delhi, born, brought up in Delhi. I uh, have studied here in Delhi, but have worked across the world. Uh, yeah, that's been, uh, that's, that's how I've moved around. India is, India is in your heart, isn't it? So no matter yes, where yes. you were. <laughs> yeah. India is home. India is home. India is home. Fantastic. So Rajiv, I want to know, so Rajiv Sharma, where does the family come from? We actually hail from Pakistan, uh, you know, undivided India. Uh, my parents migrated after the partition. Um, you know, my parents, my father met my mother, obviously. They had a love marriage. They had a little bit of a love marriage, but, uh, uh, and then they made their house. Both, they both were working, uh, which also gave a lot of openness uh, at our home. My mom was working. She was financially independent. Uh, we are a family of, uh, you know, we are three sons uh, for my parents. I'm the youngest in the family. Uh, so you can very well imagine there were four, uh, there were, there was two of my brothers and my father who are the, fa you know, father figures for me, if you will. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about my family. Fantastic. You made a reference to love marriage. And so mm -hmm. I've been keen for our audience who are out of, you know, from out of India to understand what is this concept of love marriage that we talk about? Yeah, sure. Uh, absolutely. You know, in India still, a uh, majority of the marriages happen uh, when parents select, uh, you know, a partner or a companion for uh, their children. You know, they either advertise in the newspapers uh, or their family relatives or still uh, there are priests that recommend uh, families uh, of known people, and that's how they get into an alliance. Uh, love marriages uh, earlier was not considered uh, right, uh, morally right. Uh, how could you select uh, a partner of your own choice? And right, I'm just talking about heterosexual partners. I'm not talking about uh, same-sex relationships at all. Uh, so how could you, you know, it, it, it is still in certain villages and in certain sections of society, yeah, it's considered as bringing disgrace to the family. How interesting, right? So we're talking about a culture that we've both been brought up around. Yeah, absolutely. Where there is love marriage and then there is arranged marriages. Yeah. And arranged marriages, as we know, the balance is like this, right? So arranged marriage here yeah. on top and the love marriages. And yeah, but I, I think it's, it's only now in urban India you hear live-in relationships and love marriages. Uh, but majority, uh, I would uh, I would say, still have uh, arranged marriages. So a, correct. A person chosen by your parents or elderly of the family. So this is interesting for me, Rajiv, and that's why I'm picking out on this, you know, because you're talking about traditional conventional marriages where two families yeah. get together. It's not about two people only, right? It's about two families coming together and forming a union. And, yeah. and therefore, and therefore, the union is not just based on the person. It's based on caste sometimes religion 
and so many other factors, right? In, Absolutely. In, yeah. So we're talking about a culture that we've been brought up. And then what was it like for you growing up as who you are in that in that environment? <laughs> it was difficult. Uh, it was difficult. It was challenging at times. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody else uh, during the day and I was just telling her that imagine you were you were living, you were wearing one shoe size smaller and wearing that day in, day out, you know, uh, and a part of your brain is distracted because it's causing you a pinch. Uh, it was similar for me as well. You know, it was exactly similar for me because uh, the access to information when I grew up uh, wasn't free. You know, it, it wasn't available. There was no Google. Uh, you know, there were a few libraries in and around uh, where I grew up, but I, I didn't even know, you know, what reference material to look for. Uh, there weren't any role models that you could look up to. I think the only role model I remember at that point in time was Sylvie, the hairdresser, because she uh, underwent, a, a, you know, a sex change operation as as it was called at that point in time. And obviously, I didn't have the courage to approach her. You know, uh, I didn't. And you know, sometimes uh, it was really difficult, really finding out uh, is this something wrong within me. Um, why am I, uh, you know, why when I, I would see my brothers playing cricket and I had absolutely no interest in cricket, you know, um, I had lots of friends who were girls and my mother thought it was, uh, it was affiliation of a romantic nature. Uh, you know, that's how, that's how they were a little surprised when I actually came out, but you always had girlfriends. I was like, yeah, they were friends who were girls, but they were not girlfriends. Mm. Uh, so it was difficult. Um, you know, schooling, especially my school life wasn't easy. Um, I was called names uh, in school. I was uh, shamed, uh, you know, um, and and sometimes uh, obviously made fun of. But uh, and at that point in time, you don't even know what's your fault. Why okay. are you being the butt of uh, everybody's joke? So, so Rajiv, I want to understand why were they singling you out and why were they poking fun uh, at you at school? Well, I think uh, you know. Uh, it was uh, it was a it was a variety of things. As if I look back, uh, it was my effeminate ways. Maybe uh, it was the way I carried myself. It was the way I spoke to a few people. Uh, it was also their upbringing. Uh, you know, it was also uh, they hadn't normalized uh, for them. It was all, all school uh, boys playing cricket, hanging around with guys, making fun of girls, or, or you know, I'm not say making fun of girls was uh, you know that sounds uh -huh. stereotypical, but yeah, let's say be hanging around with girls for a romantic affiliation, you know, as it happens as we are growing up. For me, it wasn't that, uh, you know, I'm, I would rather look up to boys for a romantic affiliation. Uh, and I and I remember it in class 10, I did express my love to, uh, you know, a, a colleague, uh, you know, a batchmate of mine. Um, he didn't make fun of uh, this at all. He understood, he was very mature uh, about this particular thing. Uh, somebody else got to know, and that's how, you know, it spread out uh, in the school and, and I was made fun of. Um, I've had a couple of uh, afternoons and nights. Uh, I just I've just cried to sleep. I didn't know who to look up to. I didn't know who to confide in. Um, and maybe I, at some point in time, I thought this is life. This is what uh, is going to happen to me. Um, so yeah, that that was life for me. That's interesting. So when you were little, when you were much younger, I'm talking about your school days, and you're going through this uh, stage of being ridiculed, right? I mean, we don't understand. Yeah. And when we are kids, we don't even really understand that there's yeah. something, whether it's right or wrong with us, we just kind of have a lot of self doubts. So did you at any point feel that there was something not normal? Did you feel that you were different? And did you try to fit into the normality of what we think is normal? I, uh, so in very interesting question, Raga. Uh, the reason why I say that is, uh, at, you know, there were many days when I would wake up and say, I would try to fit in, you know? I remember, I distinctly remember one afternoon uh, around Diwali when I said, I would try to fit in and I would play cricket today. I played cricket that day, but it drained me out. It, it drained me out because I wasn't made, you know, I wasn't made out for cricket at all, playing cricket at all. I was far more, uh, you know, I was maybe more, I was more inclined towards creativity, book reading, drawing, dancing, uh, but I wasn't made out for cricket at all. Uh, I, you know, I tried to fit in, I tried to fit in, but somehow every now and then I, you know, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't what people were expecting me to be. Uh, I also clearly remember uh, at some, uh, you know, when, when I was in class fifth or sixth, uh, you know, my brother, 
actually uh, you know he he said something like hey you need to uh, you need to speak properly because i had this effeminate voice uh, until about recently i would actually clear up my throat before making a presentation uh, to our leadership team uh, and i realized it uh, very recently that hey what's wrong i i think this is the way i should speak and this is how i am but i i can clearly remember that a small thing which obviously he did unintentionally which had no baggage associated with it uh, but i carried it too far that is the impressionable age you know that is that was my impressionable age and that's how you know we all kids all human beings carry it that far it was a small comment made ultimately i think like uh, i've shared before with many others uh, all everyone is looking for is acceptance Correct. you know uh, each one of us is looking for acceptance wants to fit in so i tried fitting in with even my school crowd i would hang around with this bunch of uh, boys but i realized that i wasn't i wasn't fitting in you know uh, i luckily fortunately i had a few uh, friends uh, who understood me who accepted me for who i am and they would say why why do you go in uh, why do you go and hang around with them we are there for you just be with us how beautiful you know? how beautiful is that uh, and so, and some of them have been my best friends till date and i really thank them uh, for being there for me because i realize that there are not many people who understand you and accept you for who you are you know i always say you know just one person is enough you know you don't exactly. need the whole world you know because the whole world can go against you but just that one person can have yeah. such an impact and both ways right negative exactly. and positive one positive, person yes also so and, and wonderful i just want to keep taking you back into your childhood because like you said that's a very impressionable age and we carry that for the rest of our lives until we unlearn what we have learned right which you yeah in your case only very lately you discovered that what whatever your brother said was having an impact on you now was the pressure from you from your brothers as you were growing up at school and at home to behave in a certain manner because obviously mm -hmm. uh, you know whenever anybody i mean i have had an older sibling at school as well so the conversations don't just stick to that moment they stick to your siblings as well right yeah 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 fortunately my brothers and i studied in separate schools uh, we have a we have a very big age gap you know we have about 7 and 6 uh, years age gap so by the time i was getting into uh, you know class 8 9 they were kind of graduating uh, i did have a little bit of an unsaid pressure Uh, at home uh, you know my brothers would complain to mom isko bolo ye kapde nahi hain and isko bolo wo nahi uh, but uh, they weren't like they weren't very strict about it you know somehow uh, by the time i was entering my college my brothers had migrated uh, outside india you know they had already left india uh, and i was the only child for uh, left with my mother my, my, my mother my father and my grandmother my mother was very independent uh, she had a point of view and she she knew what her point of view was and she was very independent i think uh the fact that i'm here today the fact that i'm speaking to you the fact whatever i am today is because a, a lot of confidence that she uh made sure uh that i carry forward you know i have from her she always believed in all her children uh you know even when i came out i remember uh she said uh thanks for sharing uh, she she, uh, she said that uh, you will still remain my son you know nothing's going to change um uh, i i you know i don't remember my biggest fear when i came out as well was what if i'm asked to go away from my home i didn't have a partner then i monish wasn't there with me at that point in time um you know i was alone i was single i was like uh, many gay men trying to kiss in uh, thousand frogs to find out who is my prince charming um uh, you know but then uh, I, that was my biggest fear what if my parents leave me who will i uh, who and it was not financially that i was dependent on them but i was emotionally dependent on them sure uh but they stood by me there were there were times when they would make comments that would sound stupid but never with a, a bad intention never did i hear any one of them say ki tumne kya kiya ya humne kuch paap kiya hoga you know like you hear it with sure. lots sure. of others i never heard that at all wonderful i'm going to come to that part as well but i'm just going to stay in that little childhood phase okay you yeah. made a com you made a comment about uh, your brother saying that ye kya kapde kapde for mm. those who don't understand are clothes Close, so obviously, yeah. obviously at a very young age you had decided or you had a uh, preference 
for different clothes, right? Like, I mean, we know typically how a male child dresses up. So yeah. you obviously have an affinity for something else. So can you, can you describe that and who bought those yeah, clothes? Sure. Yeah, so uh, it was it was uh, so it was not only clothes; it was also my choice of toys. You know, I would uh, I would rather buy dolls for myself, or I would rather uh, coax my mother to get me a doll. And whereas my brother would say, "Hey, let's get you a gun, or let's get you a bus, or let's get you a train." Uh, and I had a doll house, uh, you know, at that point in time. Uh, when it came to clothes, uh, it was primarily choice of color. I would I didn't like the uh, the blues and the grays. I liked the pinks and the reds and the yellows and the greens. Uh, you know. Uh, so it, uh, my parents, my mom was pretty okay with getting me anything and everything what I liked. Um, I had a, sh you know, a sense of fashion that uh, maybe somebody, you know, it was contradictory to my, you know, my family's way of uh, how I should dress up. Uh, I, I don't, rem I don't remember any big fiasco happening, but I do remember that I was definitely uh, there was a comment here and there saying, why don't you, why don't you wear a shirt and a uh, you know, a trouser and a necktie, whereas I would prefer a sherwani or a kurta pajama and, you know, a traditional wear. Uh, uh, in my brother's uh, marriage, I, I got the angarka with the stoles and, and the stoles was my way of, uh, my my way of coming out, you know, uh, of mm. flaunting the chun chunari, if you, uh, if you will. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was my way of uh, sharing uh, who I was. Uh, till then, I hadn't come out to my family at all, like I shared with you. Uh, but yeah, that that's that's how childhood was uh, for me. So, did did your mother or did your parents or your extended family at any point recognize that you were, you know, possibly in probably inclined, you know, towards yes. uh, gender? And did they make comments about it? Did they expect you to convert? Did they do no. anything to convert? No, 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 not at all, not at all. Yes, there were a few comments made that, uh, you know, I would hang around with, uh, you know, a few cousins of mine who were girls. Uh, I was best friends with them. Uh, you know, they, they would say, hey, he, I, we know they are like thick and thin. They would just hang around together. He's effeminate. But there was, those were comments. Uh, and they would tell my mom that you, you wanted, you know, you had two sons and you wanted a daughter. So maybe he's daughter to you. I don't know whether it was done, whether the comment was made with any bad intention. Uh, but it was a comment that was made and my mom mom would laugh it off and you know uh, fortunately i was good in studies uh, so that compensated uh, or you know at least my parents had uh, didn't think too much uh, i was otherwise a very obedient child uh, very good in studies uh, very disciplined uh, you know so from that perspective uh, my parents were off my back if you will <laughs> okay, so when when did you recognize and accept it for yourself your your sexual orientation. I think I uh, I fully accepted it when I was in my first year of college. Uh, you know they they were uh, they were on and off uh, you know feelings that emerged. Like I said, I shared this in class tenth with someone, uh, but uh, you know it was in college that I came to terms with my sexuality. Uh, I came to terms with the fact that hey, this is who I am, and I get attracted towards guys and. And, and it's not that guys don't get attracted towards me. There were guys who would get attracted towards me as well. Uh, so, yeah, it was primarily in college that I understood that, hey, this is my way of life and this is what my way of life will be. I was still struggling with the fact, though, whether I will come out to my family, whether this will be my way of being. Uh, I was still contemplating, still thinking that, yes, I will try and push marriage, uh, the thought of marriage or the idea of marriage uh, as far as possible. Uh, but if uh, push comes to shove, I may have to get married. That the thought of staying single with a guy hadn't crossed my mind because I wasn't really sure. There weren't enough role models available, uh, or and and I didn't, didn't even know whether my parents would accept me. You no, know, I think that was the biggest fear. Yeah, and we're talking about it at a time, right? When, like you yeah. said, there was there wasn't much awareness. I mean, yeah, early nineties. Yeah, exactly. So. In, so, you know, I mean, this, this is a conversation that we've had with many others as well in terms of when there's no awareness, you, you've kind of reached a point where you are aware of yourself. You know that you are have a certain preference, right? But others don't know. So you get involved in a relationship. How can you be assured that that person is going to be, you know, equal or partnering with you? That's a huge yeah. risk yeah. to take, right, for our community. Yeah. 
So how did you manage that? How did you manage you, that? You, you brought that out. Um, you know, in college, I had a relationship. Uh, Monish and my relationship is not the first relationship. I had a first relationship with someone else. Um, and it continued for about six, seven years. Uh, and I had thought I'd found uh, my Prince Charming. Uh, you know, uh, we were intellectually compatible uh, as well. Uh, however, he was the only son of his family and uh, and he belonged to a pretty rich family. Uh, he, it was expected of him to give a legal heir to his family uh, and he decided to get married. Uh, and when he when we kind of broke off, uh, the comments uh, still are fresh in my ears. He said, uh, well, actually I wasn't, I, I just got, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm straight or I've always been straight. Uh, I, uh, I tried this because of you, because I wanted to make you happy. Uh, and, and that was a little bit of a shock for me because, uh, I was like, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered that you tried this for, for my happiness, but why did you promise me things which you could, which you could have very well said that, Hey, this is not me. Uh, you know, you could have come out straight saying I am straight. Uh, and our relationship, you know, our relationship had some really good memories. We took a vacation together in college. If you can imagine at that time, a parent sending just the two of us for a vacation, uh, you know, uh, so we had some good times, uh, but I, I, I clearly remember that that relationship uh, left me with a very bad taste. And and it took me a couple of years to really come to terms with the fact that there are men out there who are interested beyond just the physical intimacy. Sure, because even today, we talk about 2021, right? It's very yeah. difficult to find partners of the same gender. I mean, where do you find there's hardly any dating uh, apps or dating spaces you can't just go to somebody and say oh, i think you're straight i'm attracted to you or, uh you know i'm attracted okay, to you. yeah let's you're gay so so we're talking about a time when this was even this level of awareness and this level of space was not available to us right so yeah. in that how did you meet how did you start meeting people what was the scene like in noida in delhi okay <laughs> well um sure there were a few dating uh hangout places that were known for uh for gay hangouts, there were there were a few parks that were known. Uh, there was this Yahoo room. Uh, I think I don't remember the room number, but Yahoo room number seven or something, where you would find uh, people with uh, the same orientation hanging around. Uh, you would meet people through friends, uh, and you know that's how you would meet. There there were a few. Uh, there used to be a pub uh, which every night, every Tuesday night, became a gay pub. Uh, it's in Chanakipuri, south of Delhi. Uh, I think it was called Pegs and Pines. Um, you know, so those were very few places. Uh, the others uh, were just through eye contact. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you would try out uh, to realize that uh, you tried on the wrong person, or somebody else would try on, uh, out on you, and you'll say, "Oh, we we fortunately met." But a lot of it, Raga, at that point in time, was only looking for physical intimacy. Uh, there were very little conversations about staying together. The first, uh, you know. The real first person that I met who wanted to stay together was another friend of mine. Uh, he came from Dubai. Uh, he was in uh, cabin crew uh, for Air Qatar. He, for, unfortunately, he's no more. Uh, God bless his soul. Uh, but uh, he was the one. He actually he gave me the confidence to come out to my family. Uh, he did tell you know he was out to his family and he said, "You will be playing with a lot of lives." Uh, you'll be playing with your own life. You'll be playing with the girl's life, family's life. Uh, so just think about it. Uh, there is a way of just being you know, of being gay and being out to your family. And if it means being single, it means being single. That's about it. Uh, yeah. So in the uh, gay community, especially with men, I've heard the, these stories quite a bit of the 90s in particular, where you know, men would obviously have a physical uh, intimacy and night with the partner. And then there were many occasions of aggression. Like there are instances someone shared with us the other day that in the morning you would wake up, somebody would take your VCR from the house and go away with mm. it and or give you a punch in the face and walk out or to even mm. take your scooter keys or whatever you had at that time. And there was nothing you could do because there was no law against it. So it became yeah. a community which was very scared all the time and fearful, yet yeah. you cruised. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Uh, I mean, for, uh, fortunately, I haven't come, I haven't faced this personally, but I know of friends who face this personally. Uh, they were either hit uh, or uh, money was flicked from their wallets. 
uh, you know, or uh, you know, they were threat threatened uh, that they'll be outed to the families, uh, you know, because ultimately you're every everyone at that point in time was doing it under the covers, right? Uh, there were a few, you know, especially even now there are many married men who claim to be bisexual, but we all know they got married because of uh, the pr family pressure. Uh, you know, a few of my friends who married uh, have faced that kind of uh, physical torture, emotional torture, financial torture at the hands of other men. And, and there are lots of straight men who come into this considering this is, uh, or, you know, to get into the physical intimacy to earn money, um, you know, and because they know that uh, there is no recourse available. I mean, you mean now people are waking up to going to the police but at least a few years back, you there was the shame of your own sexuality and then the shame of, hey, I was sleeping with someone else. And and, and by the way, uh, it was only in 2018 that we, that homosexuality was decriminalized. You know, prior to that, okay, you had sex, you were also a criminal. Uh, so yeah, there there have been instances, and uh, and I have I have uh, I have they've had it with a few of uh, of my close friends. Fortunately, I was spared. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm so, I'm so glad to hear that yeah. you were spared. But I've had many people we've been having conversations with, and it's it's quite painful to hear that that it's, it's happened. It's quite painful because you know obviously there is a financial dent, there is a physical dent, but more importantly, it's the emotional dent that you live with, that you live with for for lots of time, for lots of years, and and it's very difficult to overcome that. Have you ever been stopped by a cop and uh, you know given the danda? Raji was frozen. I think internet issues. We'll keep continuing. We'll keep. I'll keep talking. Raji, you are frozen. If you can hear me, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah. So yeah, I have not. I have not been stopped by a cop sorry. ever. So I'm just going or... to repeat that. Okay. I'm going to repeat that so that. So, Raji, have you ever been stopped by a cop and shown the danda? No. I've never been stopped by a cop at all. Uh, yes, there have been a uh, few uh, snide remarks made on the road uh, by passers-by. Look how is he walking? He ha he walks effeminately. He has uh, effeminisms, um, you know. But never have I been stopped by the cop. Excellent. Yeah. So over that time when you were growing up in college, you had started having uh, intimate relationships with other men. Was your environment at home all right for you to, did you feel safe to, to sit with your parents and maybe have a conversation about how you were feeling? Uh, well, actually, I think, you know, while my, uh, my parents were very open, but we never had a chance of talking about sex and intimacy with my parents, you know. Um, it was never encouraged. Uh, we had a lot of public display of affection. My father would hug me, my mom would hug me, uh, you know, but uh, never did I, never I, had I heard my brothers discussing it with uh, my parents. So obviously it was considered, I maybe I rationalized it and I was conditioned to say, hey, this is not a topic that you discuss it at home. Uh, I did have, uh, I did tell my, you know, my I, I could get both sets of friends home. I could get my girlfriends at home. I could also get my boyfriends at home. Uh, and, you know, we could study together for late nights uh, independently. Nobody would checking on us at all. Um, but never did we discuss uh, physical intimacy or sexuality at home ever till the age of 29. Wow. So interesting, because when I asked you this question, your, your response to me was that we didn't discuss sex and intimacy at home. Right. Yeah. We didn't. At, at that time, you didn't talk about sexuality. You said sex and intimacy. Yeah, and I, we I find it interesting because a lot of, you know, the queer people and when they have to come out to their parents, they worry because sexual orientation or sexuality is seen so much about sex and so much yeah. about physical intimacy then. Because it begins with that. No, it begins with uh, preferences of uh, sex. So it begins with that. And that's, and if you've not spoken about that at home, you definitely feel, uh, how do I approach this topic? Uh, is this a little bit of a taboo topic at home you know so yeah you're right so so at home were there any conversations because you're talking about it, about a time when there's no awareness there's maybe a bollywood film here and there 
you know and that yeah. bollywood yeah so did you when you watched your bollywood film together as a family did people did your family make any comments let's say no no i uh, now that you talk about it now that i uh, you asked me this question i remember uh, you know my my brothers were out they were st- staying abroad uh, and my pa- my father in my bookshelf caught a, a copy of kama sutra uh, you know uh, it was uh, it was bought together by uh, my then boyfriend and me and he written from me to you um, you know and uh, he and i was staying at my uh, i'd gone for my it was summer vacation and i'd gone to my uh, aunt's place and he called up my aunt and said hey can you send uh, rajiv back uh, when i came back home uh, the book was there on the table uh, but there was a silent treatment about this entire thing you know there was no no confrontation whatsoever that why did i find this book so it was silent treatment uh, my mom did say to ask her, so this is what you're reading these days so i said well you should be happy you know i'm just just learning more about uh, things uh, and she she looked at me and then just kept quiet and then there was this little bit of a silent treatment if you will uh, uh, you know caught it like that but there was never openness about this particular topic we could i could discuss anything and everything with her uh, till you know till i came out but this topic i don't think was ever encouraged by them <laughs> i'm just i just find it fascinating how our lives are so so much in parallel right so when did you finally meet monish and i'm yeah. i'm making an assumption that it is after meeting monish you came out to your family no, no i'm making no. an assumption okay yeah so um, you know till then i had been staying with my parents uh, and it was in the year 2005 i found a job with dell chandigarh uh, and i had to uh, move out of uh, delhi and i had to go uh, and pick up this job um, in north of india uh, and that was the time when uh, you know i was you know about 28 29 nearing that 30s uh, and there was a lot of family pressure uh, when i say family pressure uh, yes from my parents but there was also a lot of family pressure from the extended family to my mother and my father that hey why don't you get married here here are a few matches that we have does he know anyone uh, even if he knows anyone you should be comfortable because my brothers uh, my uh, my middle brother the one who's immediately elder to me had a love marriage uh, so they were pretty open with the concept of love marriage my mom uh, my mother asked me multiple times do you know someone do you want to get married to somebody who you know uh, we were open uh and it was uh, i clearly remember i had to leave in the afternoon and in the morning my mother approached the topic once again and she had a few pictures with her and she uh, kind of uh, passed on the pictures to me and say hey look uh i looked and and at by that time uh, i felt it i felt that anyways i was going out maybe this was the perfect moment uh, to really come out however i remember i choked up multiple times uh, when i came out uh, i i only kept crying and saying i love you mom i love you dad i know it may be causing you hurt but i am not attracted towards girls wow and how was the reaction my mom cried my mom cried uh, my dad uh, was there uh, was there with her uh, he had his hand on her uh, shoulder uh and then he went to the other room uh and just kept quiet uh my mom kept on crying and then by that time uh she said okay we'll talk about it uh i'm sure she did say that i'm sure there is a cure for it um uh, you know uh this is a passing phase there is a cure for it uh and then i said okay i have to leave uh and she said okay sure uh leave Uh, and they were supposed to come uh, to me after about two weeks because my father had planned his cataract in Chandigarh, and he thought he would they would stay with me. Uh, and I, uh, you know, Chandigarh is not very far from Delhi; it's just about a four, five, four and a half hours drive. I, I reach Chandigarh by evening, and next day morning, I get a call from my mother saying, "Hey, we are coming tomorrow. We don't want to leave you alone. Uh, we are coming tomorrow." uh don't worry whatever you've shared uh, it's with us uh, we'll talk about it when we come there uh for at least 24 hours there was a lot of burden on me that maybe this was it i'll never get to see them again uh and maybe they will just come back and say we don't need you anymore in our lives um uh, and maybe my brothers would kind of uh, say hey you're out of the family uh, you've disgraced the family but it wasn't meant to be by my, my 
both my parents uh, turned up uh, on this Tuesday morning uh, to Chandigarh. We hugged each other. They stayed with me for over six to seven weeks. Uh, in those six to seven weeks, uh, we talked about uh, this aspect multiple times. So she asked me, when did you know were there people in your life? Uh, she did say that uh, maybe you can get married to a girl who's, uh, you know, not a she, she didn't know gay lesbian terminology at all but she said that there are women who may not want physical intimacy and i said well mom i'll i'll not be doing justice i'll not be truthful to myself uh, and she they never pressurized me at all raga they didn't even pressurize me to go to a doctor or something like that we did visit a counselor uh we did visit a counselor uh however the counselor counseled my parents uh, instead of counseling me fortunately he was one of the very good counselors in chandigarh uh, and when we came back, uh, or actually when they were leaving, her only concern was who is going to take care of you when we are gone. Uh, she didn't say find someone, but she said who's going to take care of you when we are gone. That's my only worry. Your brothers are settled. They have families of their own. And that's my only, only worry. Um, we hugged each other. Uh, they left. Uh, and then I think immediately in month or two, uh, Monish and I met. Um, and I got them introduced after about a year. But yeah, that's how it was. It's such a heartwarming story, Rajiv. You know, I was just waiting, uh, thinking, okay, it's some, there's going to be a twist somewhere. But you know, the twist to me is the fact that they accepted you, acknowledged you, and they just loved you for who you were. And you know, audience watching, this is what it coming out should be. and But also it should not be. There should be no Rajivs um, who have to have even 24 hours of, you know, questioning and self-doubt and worrying whether their parents, you know, will our parents will yeah. not accept us and reject us. I think the biggest yeah. fear for us is rejection. I mean, I was rejected by my mother, as you know, and mm -hmm. it is. A, it's, I think it's very painful for a child to be rejected. Imagine being rejected one mango you want and they say, no, don't have it. You hurt. You fall. You have a fall and oh. you hurt your knees and your mother is not there to look after you, you hurt. But yeah. imagine when yeah. you want something, this is life changing for you and this is what it is and your parents don't accept you, your mother in particular, it's very painful. So I'm so pleased that your story has been so painful, but smooth as well. So in yeah. that journey, after you met, was Monish now, I want to talk about your partner mm -hmm. Monish, who I think is absolutely wonderful because he has you as a partner. So, so Rajiv, was when you met Monish, was he out? Was he open? He uh, he has a very different perspective to sexuality, Raga. He's uh, he's he's elder to me, so you can very well imagine, you know, a generation maybe prior to me. Uh, so he believes, uh, don't don't ask, don't say, don't say, don't ask. So he uh, he shared with his mother that I don't want to get married. Uh, he would get his boyfriend's home. Uh, but uh, he hadn't clearly shared ever till date. He hasn't told her that I'm gay. <laughs> I tell her, we're gay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and he believes that uh, it's fine. I, I think uh, he, he comes from a Bengali community. And I don't want to stereotype, but I feel that they are far more acceptance. They have a far more acceptance levels uh, of sexuality, of physical of relationships in general, you know, uh, and uh, I think uh, my my now mother in law, uh, you know, she uh, she's accepted us like wholeheartedly. Uh, she was the first person that I met from his family. And actually, let me just tell you how we met. Uh, we met through a common friend, Raga. And uh, we kept on talking over the phone for about a week, 10 days. And then I drove down from uh, Chandigarh to Delhi to meet up with him. Uh, my partner is a chef. Uh, he used to work with India International Center. Uh, and we went out uh, in the evening. We were supposed to go out on a date, uh, a lunch, or actually a dinner. And he said, okay, before we go out for dinner, can I take you to a temple? Uh, imagine when you've experienced people who say, can we go to the bed <laughs> straight away? Here is a person who's wanting to take you to a temple. Um, and I'm like, yeah, sure, we can go to a temple. That, that sounds better. Uh, and we went to a temple. And while we were praying, you know, my eyes were closed. His eyes were, I'm sure, were closed too. He actually slid a ring, a ring across my ring finger. 
and i was deeply deeply touched oh my god i was deeply touched and he said i don't know i am he said i'm tired of looking around uh you are one perfect person that i feel can bring about change uh and can bring in stability in my life uh you don't need to accept this ring of uh, uh, you know this ring right now you also don't need to give it back to me right now take your time but i'm there for you 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 had a fairy tale life i'm sorry i want to life <laughs> <laughs> yes i do I, i there is a lot uh you know there is a lot of gratitude uh when i hear other stories i i definitely feel for them uh because because i i know it's it's been hard on them but yes i i truly acknowledge the fact that i've had a real fairy tale life uh you know so that's how we met uh, raga uh and then uh, just in a few months uh, he gave up his job at india international center and uh, you know relocated to chandigarh and said hey here i am overnight you wouldn't believe next day morning i find uh, a person with a bag full of clothes and saying hey here's what i'm going to i'm going to stay with you and there was this fear there was this uh, you know we had uh, i was staying in a rented accommodation there was this fear oh what will i tell to the landlady and you wouldn't believe we had the same maid who would go to my landlady's house in our house and i had to you know uh, lock him up in a store for one when she came home for cleaning and next day morning i realized oh, i mean sorry to my part my friends what the fuck we paid for the rent for it why should you be locked in the house you should be living with me and then we never told my landlady but she understood uh and we we never faced any bit of uh, you know either taunts or saying you know you we cannot rent this accommodation to you and so on and so forth uh but that's how we started living together uh and and ever since it's been you know every year we uh, we celebrate uh, our uh, companionship both of us don't remember the date uh we sell i know it was somewhere around holi so that weekend after holi is when we celebrate a companionship and this year we celebrated our 16 years of being together wow <laughs> how beautiful is this story you know i love actually monish's story and it's because you know it's so mainstream for him to say that i don't need to come out right i don't need to talk about my situation yeah. that is how it should be rajiv that's in exactly. our world why do we have to exactly. have these conversations really yeah. how was it to come out and what did you what challenges did you face because why should it be like this and this exactly. is and i therefore i would love to meet monish some day and i'd love to sit and have a conversation with him and touch his feet and say this is life this is how it should be for all of us but uh, you know this is this journey now you have accepted yourself you found your partner i'm sure at that time you didn't know it was long term but now 16 years yeah. is a beautiful time you've come out to your parents what about the work environment were you at all this point you were working also right so were you out at work did they other, no. did you, okay yeah so did you face yeah. any such you know homophobia no i didn't face homophobia but it was just this fear that kept on you know kept on holding me back uh, for work it's been a, a very good uh, you know a joy ride as well i never came out for the first few years at work at all you know uh i was also you know i was also trying to be successful in my roles that i was playing uh so for the first 5 years i never came out uh when i joined a, a company it was a us collections company uh it was a listed company so i i went through the policies and when you're in hr you get to know what are the policies and you know uh so there was this uh, harassment policy which clearly spelled out uh, homosexuality there was conduct at workplace and all of that uh but these were american policies that were brought to india as well i did have uh, my moments of weakness uh, when i say when you know my my boss would say hey uh, why don't you get your girlfriend along to the party and i would say well she's not here and things like that you know i had to make up uh, make up excuses because i i somehow didn't know whether whether my boss is homophobic not homophobic uh but at at one point in time uh, there came a time when i felt that why am i hiding what am i hiding because uh, i'm you know for this i'm not bringing my most authentic self to work there is a little bit of me that i have to check out every day at the office parking and then come inside and then when i go back i have to wear that myself and then go back home so i told him that uh, told him one day that hey this is what my reality is you know i was heading hr for this particular company uh, and he accepted it he was he was pretty comfortable with it But my biggest acceptance raga came when we had a global ceo who was visiting india 
uh, we had uh, become a great place to work. You know, we were recognized by the Great Place to Work Institute, and he threw a, a spouse dinner. You know, he threw a spouse dinner. Uh, by then, I, I don't think he he was aware about my sexuality. Uh, and then my manager went ahead and told him that, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, maybe we need to change this name. It shouldn't be called spouse dinner. And and he was also giving him hints because he was also wasn't sure if uh, my our global CEO is as open. Uh, and he said. What are you, where are you hinting? What are you telling me? Uh, I think they got into a deeper conversation. Uh, they exchanged uh, information about myself. And I, I saw my global CEO walk up to me, walk him into my office and said, hey, Pradeep, we want you to get Monish along. And he okay. just said that. And it was changed overnight. It was changed from spouse dinner to partner dinner. Uh, and the entire evening when Monish and I walked in uh, for that dinner, it was at Trident Gurgaon. Uh, I could only see you know, my colleagues trying to make both of us feel comfortable, make Monish comfortable. Uh, he, our global CEO, you know, just stood, uh, shared the same table with us, kept on having discussions with him. You know, they were also bonding on food and, uh, you know, archaeology. And Monish's father was in Department of Archaeology and was based at Taj Mahal. And you know how uh, Americans have this big, uh, you know, big uh, fascination. Conditioning, yeah, fascination for Taj Mahal. Uh, so yeah, uh, so ever after that, I have never hidden uh, my sexuality at workplace at at all. Uh, at my current organization as well, it, I came out. You know, earlier I would come out when I had joined the company, but this time I came out even at the time of my interview. And uh, I'm blessed that my boss didn't even bat an eyelid, and he was like, "Oh, wonderful, great." So uh, you know, how how are things between the two of you? How's everything else? And and uh, you know, it it just felt. Uh, natural. It just felt so. Uh, it didn't feel as if you know I'm trying to be someone else at work. Uh, we openly discuss. You know, my fr my team members or my colleagues openly ask me about Monish how is he. Uh, we haven't had you know ever since we've joined. In within a few months, we've been in COVID and you know have been we've been working from home. But I'm sure when there is a time, we will meet together with families and and this will only grow and prosper. We've made some very good changes uh, in our policies practices. Uh, the first and foremost change that we brought about is, uh, you know, our policies are gender neutral. You know, uh, we don't use the word he and she. We use the word they. Uh, we, our maternity benefits are uh, eligible for anybody who uh, identifies themselves as mother of the child. Uh, we also extend marriage benefits to same-sex uh, partners, and insurance and life uh, benefits to same-sex partners as well. So, yeah. How, how amazing. We need more Rajivs in this world, right? In the corporate space. No, we really do. It's 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 really heartening to see the changes that are happening in India. And I know it is, you know, the, the conversation is uh, happening a lot. It's the momentum is also gaining, right, in India. Yes. Uh, thanks to, yes. I mean, I, I, I receive hundreds of calls every week just on conversations from the corporate uh, uh, space. You know, uh, I believe that you and Monish bought a property together. And I know anyone no, can we, buy properties, right, if they have money. But the reason yeah. I wanted to talk to you about it, because we have a unique problem in India for the LGBTQ community, right? I couldn't buy a property yeah. in India with Nicola. I'm, I don't know about your experience, because the bank wouldn't give us a mortgage. They wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't acknowledge us as a couple. They said, you can be two friends. Nicola, and they didn't give me an idea of saying, call, him, call her Mr. Nicola. And later on, we'll say there was a mistake. In this, in you know, in the title. So, how was your experience? Yeah, they were. They, it was hard. It was difficult. This is not our. Uh, this is not a first property. We bought a house in Pondicherry. We bought another house in Noida. Uh, but this time, uh, you know, I I had the resolve to make sure that you know we're buying it together. Even now, uh, the property is still in my name, but he's the he's the primary guarantor for the property. You know, if you will. Uh, they wanted. Uh, they wanted to basically make sure that. Uh, you know, uh, they wanted somebody to be a guarantor for the property, for the house loan, and they wanted somebody from the family. And I was like, well, my brothers are not uh, Indian citizens. Uh, my parents are no more. So uh, I would rather have Munish. And uh, my banker checked with me. I, is this a long-term relationship? I hope you don't, you know, I, if something happens to you, what, uh, you know, what, uh, what, ha what happens to the property? I said, well, I'll write my will and this property will go to him. Yes, the laws are archaic, Raga. Uh, 
we it's a long way to go uh but this was a very humble beginning the humble beginning was when we when we sat down together for the grah pravesh puja and when the priest said do it together mm. i think that was that was the biggest acceptance that uh, was the biggest acceptance <laughs> so the priest himself said to do the puja together yeah, yeah he said why not mm. and that's what you've been longing for your entire life god you made me all teary i i wish this for all Sorry. of us you know i i can i can understand and appreciate your emotion because i think the day nikla and i are able to buy a property in india in our names together i i think a part of me will settle that soul you know which is not at peace will settle because that means it's an absolute acknowledgement of our love and our relationship right and our commitment to each other and it's sad that we have to wait for the financial institutions in india to decide that for us yeah but you know change only happens slowly i guess you know but yeah. i'm so, yeah. so pleased i'm you you really made me teary i'm it's a it's a yeah. beautiful thing Sorry, but... no but thank you you know this is what we talk about real, real stories real people real lived experiences and you know audience watching please understand we are real people with our re with real emotions we exactly. are not, not like any i mean how am i different how are you different rajiv we love exactly. we want the same space in everybody's life and we're not committing any crime we just love Absolutely. love to be celebrated and how can love be uh, you know uh, i don't know if you read uh, the recent uh, ruling uh, that the tamil nadu government gave he said uh, he he bought the responsibility the, the judge bought the responsibility on his own self he said we need to understand it they don't need to mm -hmm. fit it i he he took the responsibility on him he said it's it's loving and sharing and caring and how is that ever becoming illegal how exactly. is that becoming illegal it can happen between two people i may not understand it today but that doesn't mean it cannot happen he he's got the heart i think from all of us yeah. right justice uh, anand yeah. vikash what a yeah. fantastic and i keep talking about it on all my shows saying that how amazing it is that a person i mean you look at him if you have to yeah. look at somebody and how we pass a judgment right people will look at me yeah. and have a certain judgment they've looked at you called you names for being effem effeminate and look at him i would say conservative traditional man what will he understand but yeah. to me he is conservative he is traditional but he has one point of difference he was yeah. willing to educate himself yeah, absolutely and he said ignorance is not a bliss he said i it the responsibility lies in within me yeah. to make myself more aware and yeah. he did everything he spent time with uh, the community he spent time with uh, people working in this particular space to get educated and that's how it should be exactly and no and and what what is even beyond that rajiv that he actually passed a ruling saying that yeah. these are things that need to change you know change. making safer simple things like harassment you have a problem you go to the cops you get harassed the community yeah. gets harassed. i mean as simple as that you should be able to feel safe in your home at your workplace in your school in general in society and exactly and that's why we need laws that's why we need more stories rajiv like yours like mine you know like so many others from our community so that we can keep changing the narrative one story at a time you know you i had a beautiful beautiful discussion with you i'm so pleased that we could have this time with you is there anything that you want to share before we end this conversation yeah sure the two things that i like to share you know i know uh, you said uh, we need more rajiv like you but we also need more people who have supported me in this journey who who ha i you know i it'll be unfair of me to take the entire uh, credit for myself i i had the courage because there were people who were behind me who held me who nurtured me so uh, it's thanks to all my previous and my current bosses my peers my colleagues my friends who stood by me that's one thing the other thing uh, that i'd like to share uh, you know and i and i have been thinking about this what next for us uh, you know i'd like to parent a child i uh, i'd like i know uh, you know i think a lot of it begins with good parenting and i think in both position i can be good parents but our laws really suck uh covid has made so many children often and i'm sure there are others like me who would who would want to give good uh you know upbringing to children but our laws and uh, really are prohibitive uh they don't allow us 
uh, to be a good parent and 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 for me that will be a day of change when you know uh, a same sex couple would be able to adopt a child in india and uh, pass on good parenting and a good future to a child i i so agree with you and i hope that day arrives soon and it is i think harder for men to men to be seen as parents internationally it's now quite common and normal yeah uh, i i need to tell the audience that nikla and i my partner and i have been together for 14 and 1/2 years now and we have brought up my children from my first marriage who are now our children and the kids were very little when uh, you know when nikla came into our life they are now 23 years old very Wonderful. sorted as functional and as dysfunctional as any of other course. adult so being gay parents doesn't give them extra powers or being with heterosexual couple parents doesn't give you any special powers either so a child just grows beautifully with love and i can tell you in our community we are full of love and that is and we have fought many many yeah. battles to come here so yeah. we understand love we understand how to give love and we understand how to receive love so you know Rajiv, I hope that uh, we can connect you. And uh, if you you are not already connected with Prince Manvendra Goel, they are fighting this fight as well. And he has been talking Wonderful. to the government to for adoption rights for uh, you know same uh, gender couples. So let's take this forward: marriage rights, anti-discriminatory laws, and adoption rights. I think Absolutely. these are the base, basic human rights for beautiful Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Thank you Rajiv what Thank a beautiful so conversation. Much. Thank you for sharing so openly you know for bringing your entire self here on on the show. Pleasure is all mine Raghavan. Thank you so much for being a wonderful host. Thank you and Nikola thank you for your support in the back end and I know you help curate this beautifully and audience do write into us at the views room at gmail.com. All these stories are available on YouTube. Please subscribe to Raga Olga Dissilva on YouTube. Please share we need to share these narratives with anyone and everyone especially with those who do not understand the lgbt and what we are about so thank you very much and i'm signing out sorry there's a gift partner we have there's a gift partner who has come on board with organic stuff called the herbal theory and herbal theory thank you very much and uh, rajiv you will be receiving your little hamper soon i hope you enjoy it signing out at totally out now remember closets are for clothes not for hiding your truth so you're watching today with totally out now presented by the views room thank you again audience and rajiv much much love to you and bonish thank you thank you bye bye